one thing to remember about the book of Revelation, particularly the messages to the seven churches. That's our study at this time. They were literal churches. They were not just some kind of imaginary places. These were real churches in real towns, in real places. Uh, they were they were a real groups of people and a, people churches that had pastors and had congregations and had ministries. And so Jesus uh, himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, gave a message to seven of those churches. And uh, it's pretty amazing how that he could look right into them and say, okay, this is a need that you have. And this particular message tonight uh, is kind of a sobering one because it has to do with the church in Sardis. Let's look in chapter 3. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirit, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. And when I read that, I think, wow, that's a, that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it, to a church? Verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain and that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received, hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If, therefore, thou shalt not watch, I will come upon come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy and he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot his out name out of the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear to hear, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's say, just have a moment of prayer. Father, help us to learn something from this passage tonight in our own personal lives and Lord, even in our church life. May you bless us together tonight and we thank you, Lord, that we can serve you here in this church. As you have brought us together tonight, may you strengthen us uh, to serve you in a, in a better way. In Jesus' name, amen. These churches in, in Asia, seven churches, were very uh, interesting churches. They were in, uh, each one had a location that was, that was particularly interesting. This particular town, Sardis, uh, Sardis was at the foot of a mountain about 30 miles from Thyatira, and it was a, a place that was an ancient capital city in, in Lydia, one of the richest cities in the area. As a matter of fact, it's probably one of the first places that they uh, would mint coins, and money was minted there. So they were a wealthy, wealthy city. It was a place that was a center of the carpet industry also, and that was one that uh, was a very important city to many people. The name Sardis means escaping ones or those who come out. And this, this message uh, comes to them and it corresponds with some times in church history. Many of the, many of the uh, things that happened in the, in the Bible, we saw their uh, fruition really in church history. And this particular time, the time where the church is spoken of as dead, was really at the end of the Dark Ages. It was a hard time. And, and during that time, several of the reformers came out. Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church. And, and uh, there was much that started happening there. They began to stand up against a, a hierarchy of religion in the world at that time that was controlling everyone. We find here that Jesus speaks to them. You saw in the, Re in the Reformation, it, it was a time where many of those uh, people got rid of some of their rituals and some of the things that were happening. But it was also somewhat of a political movement too. And so uh, it, was, it was kind of an interesting time. Who spoke this message? Look at it, it says, He that hath 
the, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things it saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. This is a symbol that speaks of the Holy Spirit and his fullness or his completeness or his power. In Christ, it is his desire, the desire of the Lord Jesus Christ to control his church through the Holy Spirit. By the way, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just a force that swings through the universe and touches one and another and another, but he indwells us as believers. We know that he is there within us. And the church also collectively is a body of Christ and the Spirit of God should be in control, amen? And the church should be alive, amen? If the Holy Spirit is there in his fullness and the people in the church are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, then it should be a really living place, shouldn't it? I mean, it should be exciting to be in church, amen? I'm excited to be here tonight. How many of you are excited to be here? How many of you just got here but because you got here? Okay, amen. How many of you don't know if you're here yet? Okay, some of you, everybody's here. The fact is, uh, this was a great need in the church in Sardis. They needed the fullness of the Holy Spirit in this church that Jesus pronounced dead. Wow. What would it mean for a church to be dead? And now that's a rhetorical question, but let me ask you, does anyone have an idea of what, what would it mean if a church was dead? You can respond just real quickly. What would be a dead church? No souls coming to Christ, right? Well, it's another thing. One more thing. Well, we're going to read this and we're going to see something that uh, it points out. It says that Jesus says, I know thy works. I know your works. There in verse 1. These one that had the seven spirits of God. We just finished a study in, on Sunday nights here at church for the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what class? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, right? Those are the fruit of the Spirit, and it ought to be evident in the, in the, in the local church. They needed the fullness of the Spirit then. We're living in the, in the church age today, which is really the the time of the Holy Spirit working in church. And all the grace and peace that we need in the local church uh, is assured to us as we're filled with the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is much needed today. And it says, he that hath the seven stars. The seven stars are the pastors. And the pastors noticed here are in his right hand. In chapter 1, it talks about that in 1, verse 20. It says, The mystery of the seven stars that thou sawest on my right hand, the seven golden, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou hast seen, or hast, thou sawest, are the seven churches. Pastors are in the hand of God, the right hand of God, if you will because they belong to Jesus Christ. They don't just belong to the church, they belong to him. Every pastor that's a God-called pastor is one who is in the hand of God. I don't know about you, but that's an awesome thing to think about. It's an amazing thing to think about, and that you as a, as a man, as a pastor, are in the hand of God. It's sobering. Notice he says, he says, I know your works. You know, pastors need to take their orders from Jesus, right? Amen. They should take their orders from the Holy Spirit, the Word of God in their life to lead the family of God, the, ch the church. Amen. The church has always been meant to be directed and guided by the pastor, a spirit-filled pastor of a local church. Amen. The church is never turned over to a governing board somewhere in some other town. Amen. Nor should it be in a governing board, even locally. 
Although there are deacons and men that work together with the pastor, it is still a pastor that's in a very particular spot. Holy Spirit controlled and filled to carry out that office. He is filled with, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the head. He's the head. He's the one that's really in charge. And uh, when anyone else seeks to be the head, there's a lack of life and a lack of love in the church. If someone comes into a church and they begin to say, well, I think I ought to be able to tell the pastor what to do, they're stepping in some very dangerous territory. He said, well, that's why that, was that why that church was dead? Well, it may have been. We're not given the total details about it. Notice it says here, I know thy works. This is an admonition he gives them, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. They were recognizing the community as being very alive. They were recognized for all they were doing. They were known as a very uh, active church, a beehive of activity, a place where so much was going on, very organized, and yet the Lord says, you've got a name, you're live, you're active, you're busy, you're doing all these things, but you're dead. Wow. Something was missing there, was it not? Something was going on there that they needed to, that Jesus wanted to address in that church. The church was functioning on its reputation of a once glorious past. At one time, it no doubt was a very vibrant church, but at this particular time, it says that it was not alive. They were attending, they were praying, they were giving, they were uh, there, but the fire had gone out. The fire had gone out in their spiritual lives. Just like artificial flowers. Have you ever looked at a flower and, and t touched it, looked at it, and you think, that's a beautiful flower, and all of a sudden you touch it, and you, you notice it's not real. As a matter of fact, it's plastic. It looks nice, but you don't have to water that. It's artificial. It's not real. And this church was a lot like that. They looked okay. They looked fine from the, on the outside. Everything on the outside was beautiful. It was great. It was, it was uh, um, all smiles probably. And yet they were missing something very important. The condition of the church depends on the one through, uh, on the eyes through which it's diagnosed. You know, Jesus could see the church in a different way than people around it saw it. You see, he could examine the church inside. The Bible tells us that we look on the outward appearance. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, when, when uh, Samuel the prophet was gone to anoint a new king, one of, the men, one of the men that was brought in before him, one of the sons of Jesse, came in and, and he was a tall, strapping young man. And, the, and uh, Samuel thought, this is probably him. This would be the right man. And uh, the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance or in the height of his stature because I've refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Wow. Well, we know the story about David the king. David was a shepherd boy out in, the, out, in the, out in the field. He came in smelling like sheep and then got anointed as the next king, didn't he? The fact is, God looks on the inside. And when the Lord was looking at this church in Sardis, he was looking at them saying, I know your works and you have a need there. You're not alive. I have not found. Notice back in Revelation 3, verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for. I have not found thy works perfect before God. That's a very serious thing, isn't it? The word perfect there means finished or complete, fulfilled. What Jesus was saying was your works have not been fulfilled. They were not carrying out the purpose that God had given them for their existence. What is the purpose of the church's existence? Is it so we can have coffee and donuts on Sunday? No, although I like them. 
they don't like me, but I like them anyway. Uh, there, is it to be? Is it uh, to to do uh, social activities? Well, I like those too. But what is the real purpose of it? We've been given a purpose, haven't we? We've been given a purpose, and that's to declare the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the purpose. And in the process of all of that, the Word of God helps us to solve a whole lot of human problems. It helps us to get uh, the comfort we need when we're hurting. The Bible and the Holy Spirit helps us to find leadership and purpose in life. But it all comes back to the fact that we have to come back to Him. Ephesians chapter 4. You know, this church in Sardis was one that was spiritually alive, spiritually uh, physically rather, physically alive, but spiritually dead. In Ephesians 4, verse 17, the Bible here talks about some that were not walking in, in the right relationship with God. Here, the Apostle Paul encouraged the folks in Ephesus in verse 17 of chapter 4, there in, in Ephesians, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of your, their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness in their hearts. Wow. Their understanding darkened. Apparently in Sardis, that very thing had happened. And the great physician looked at them and pronounced them dead. Wow. Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13 is an interesting thought we find in the Scripture. He talked about his own people in Israel and what they needed to draw back to him. Here the Lord said about his people for Wherefore the, Lord say, wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, but their lips do, and their lips do honor me, but hath removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by a precept of men. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm wondering what we need in America to wake us up spiritually in this country we're living in. Amen? I mean, do we need a wake-up call? I mean, we're already getting wake-up call after wake-up call right now. Amen. We've had a pandemic. Prices are going out the ceiling. I don't know about you, but it hurts to find out how much it costs to fill my car, let alone other, everything else. And other things are changing. And many of you in, in life are trying to figure out, how am I going to buy a house? How am I going to have a place to live? What is going to happen in my life? And is that all a symptom of some spiritual needs in our country and our land and our world? You know, ladies and gentlemen, you can have everything and yet not really have the Lord in your life. Amen? There's so much today that people have. You can have the best house, you can have the best car, you can have the best clothes, you can have the best health, and yet, just like that, things can change. That's not in the outline, but I thought it fit in there. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, we need a, a spiritual life within us, don't we? We don't want the Lord to say, you're dead. I don't want him to say that about me. Do you? No. And yet, how many times in this world we're living we're kind of marginalized as believers saying, now don't get too vocal about your faith. After all, you know, we have separation of church and state, and you don't want to talk much about that in public. We need to talk about Jesus in public, amen? We need to talk about Christ as being alive and well and the one that gives us purpose in life. Jesus condemns, and he always did condemn an outward appearance of religious activity that was not directed by the Holy Spirit. In the book of Matthew, chapter 23, he spoke about the Pharisees. In Matthew 23 and verse number 5, he, he rebuked them. In Matthew 23, verse 5, he says, But all their works they do for to be seen of men, they make 
broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms and feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue. And greetings in the market and be called rabbi, rabbi, and so forth. The Pharisees loved to be recognized for what they were doing. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen, what I've found and maybe many of you have also found too. You can be recognized by a lot of people, but you really, what really counts is what's inside of you at night when you pillow your head at night. And when you go through life and you make your decisions and your choices and you, you raise a family and you have a church life where you are, you are involved and you uh, can help someone else. The Reformation period is a time where a group of men came out of the, the uh, Catholicism, so to speak, and, and, uh, but they did not come out far enough. In so many churches today, the gospel is left in a coffin instead of being the banner of believers. I want you to know that as far as I'm concerned, the cross is empty. Jesus is alive. Amen? He's not still hanging on a cross, nor is he in a tomb. He's alive on the throne uh, at the right hand of the Father, and he is alive. And by the way, we talked to him today several times. Amen? He's still alive and hears and answers prayer. He is the one we, we trust in. But in many places today, prayer is just a formality. In some places, it's just kind of going through the motions. May that never be so with you and I. Amen? Notice in verse 4, though. He says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He says, There's a few who've kept themselves free from the encumbrances of the world. There's been a few. There was a few people in that church in Sardis that still were remaining true to God's Word and living in a close relationship with the Father. He said, you've got a few there. There's a nucleus, there's a core of people that's still there. Strengthen the things that remain. Strengthen. They were in a minority. The word few means a small group, a slight group, a little group. You know, ladies and gentlemen, today the world says, well, just go ahead and go along with everything they're doing. But I want to remind you of what the Bible says in Matthew 7, verse 13. You can turn there if you have your Bible. Matthew 7, 13. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight in the, is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. It seems there in, Re in the book of Revelation chapter 3 that this church in Sardis had a group of people that were in the minority, but they really did care about their church and the Lord and their pastor. They really did care. They were a small group. They were a, an active group. They were alive. And here the Lord approves them. He says you know, they... They would not follow the crowd and say, well, the crowd that was going the wrong way, by the way. They would not find a sense of security in following a crowd and never taking a stand for anything. Ladies and gentlemen, there's some things that are still sin in the world. Amen? Sin is still practiced in our world. As a matter of fact, it's glorified and glamorized and publicized and every kind of eyes you can think of in order for people to continue to feel okay about it. But ladies and gentlemen, today, you have a very important role. You as a Wednesday night attender, a person stand, sitting in church, and some of you that are watching online, you care enough about God, you're going to listen to a service where someone opens God's Word and you, you come in to hear something. You may feel like you're in the minority, but I want you to know God knows you're here. God knows and he cares about how you follow him. He said, well, wait a minute. I'm not a popular one in the world. Don't worry about that. 
He said, well, I'm not in the majority in my family. You may be the only one that's coming to church, or maybe you may be a small fa- a family among several that do not. Or maybe there's some other issues that I haven't even talked about tonight. Thank God for those who maintain a good witness for Christ and have not been bogged down in the doubts and defilements of the world. Listen, my friend, Jesus is coming back, and it's worth it to serve him. Amen? Now, that's where you can say amen. It's a good time for it. Okay? It's worth it to serve Jesus. Amen? Brother Orrick, isn't it right? Isn't it worth it? He's had some people saved there in, in, uh, in England. Wow. Amen? How many did you baptize the other day? 17 baptized. Now, I'm telling you, that's exciting. Amen? I want to support people like that. And others are going out, starting churches in other places in the world. It's important. We're involved in a great, great work. Amen? Some of you need to smile about that. Amen? We're in a great work for God. And you know, I'm interested in doing something great for God, aren't you? I want to be in church where I can be involved in some great things. Ladies and gentlemen, today, Jesus says to you and me, too, I know your works. I know where you are spiritually. You strengthen the things that remain. How can we strengthen our spiritual lives? Now, this is where you can feed back here a little bit. How do you strengthen your spiritual life? Anyone? What's that? Read the scriptures. What's another? Someone, I saw a hand over here. Someone else. Same thing. Get in your word. Get in the word of God. Right. What's something else? Yes, sir. And pray. Amen. What's the great incentive to pray for us is Jesus prayed. We ought to pray too. Amen. He even took time to just get apart from everything and set time apart to talk to the Father. Don't neglect those spiritual disciplines that are so basic but so important. In every generation, God has his few people. He had Noah in the time when the whole earth was filled with violence and all kinds of sin, and God spared Noah and his family. Are they call in? He had Daniel who stood true to the Lord. He had Job. Job was the one who, who stayed true to the Lord even though he went through severe trials. Many have stood for God alone at times. And you may even experience that as a a believer. You may have to stand alone sometimes. It may not be an easy thing. But I want you to know, he knows your works. He knows your heart. And he examines us in the way that he knows everything about us. It says, these which have not defiled their garments. What it's talking about is, you know, the garments here are what, or to the body, what habits are to our real self. The garment here is used in a, fig, in a figurative sense. You know, how we dress is important, whether it's clean or dirty, and, and whether it fits or be, is becoming or not. But a Christian must also exercise care about the wardrobe of your soul. To put on as the elect of God, holy and beloved, uh, the bowels of mercies it talks about in Colossians chapter 3. Here Jesus says to them, strengthen those things that remain. He that overcometh, they shall walk with me in white. He said, thou hast a few names, and they not defile their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. They will walk with me. White is the color of heaven. I'm going to wear white in heaven. You are too if you're a child of God. It's a robe of righteousness that's provided by our Savior. He is providing us that robe of right. We're going to ride back. He's going to come on a white horse. And we're going to ride on white horses. Amen. And white is a great color. It's the color of heaven. It's the absence of defilement. And uh, he, we're going to be clothed in the brightness of our Lord. That's what is pictured here. In verse number 2, go back to that verse, and then we'll look at verse 5. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Strengthen the things which remain. Strengthen and revive what remains. It is and that's at the point of death. 
Wow. I hope that you and I as believers, how many of you have been saved 40, 50 years already? Some of you have been saved. Some of you haven't been on the planet that long, but that's okay. Some of you discovered America less than 30 years ago or 40 years ago. So, amen. The fact is that you and I have the opportunity to walk with the God, with the Lord for a lifetime. Some of you have been walking with the Lord for a lifetime. What a wonderful thing it is to know him and to know the joy of knowing him. Be watchful, it says. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. There are a few in Sardis that were watchful, but there were some that were not, apparently. And others were falling, around, falling all around them. We need to salvage the gifts and talents that remain. Hold fast, Jesus said. He tells them, hold fast to those things. And he tells you to hold fast to what you believe in the Word of God. Hold fast to it. There'll be someone that'll come along your way and say, well, no, I don't get too serious about the Lord. Well, he was pretty serious about us, amen? He was very serious about us when he went to a cross and was nailed to it for us. He paid the price. Verse 3, it says, If thou shalt not watch, I will come as thee, on thee as the thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. The, Lord, the Lord's coming means different things to different people. I'm looking forward to it, amen? But there's some people who are going to be scared to death. Jesus comes, they're going to say, Whoa, I wasn't looking for that. No, he will come. To us who are saved, we welcome him as his bride. We welcome the Lord, even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come, Lord, come and take us home. To an unbeliever, he's coming as a thief. To those who do not trust him. And when he comes, it'd be too late to repent. And it's time to repent now. It's time to be saved now. Let me encourage any, any that would need uh, to take this time to think about your eternity. If you're not sure where you're going, make sure. Don't wait until one day you say, well, I'll, I'll get ready someday. I'm not ready right now. I've already talked to someone this week that had th that very statement. I, I'm, I'm just not ready. Well, when are you going to get ready? Amen? Because eternity can come when you're not ready. Death can knock on your door when you're not ready. Be an overcomer. Verse 5, there in Revelation 3, it says, He that overcometh shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And I will, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. To he that overcomes, he will never erase the overcomer's name from the book of life. In the ancient cities, they had a registry of all the people in the city. They put the names down in a registry. They wrote their names down. But if someone committed a terrible crime, a heinous crime, they would erase their name off the roll of that city. They would blot them out. They did not want them included in their city's registry. For those who are faithful believers, there's no fear, no fear of that. I'm not afraid of my name being blotted out. Jesus paid the price for me, amen? He shed his blood on the cross so that I could be saved, so that you could be saved. And today we don't have to fear of that. Our names are forever recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And one of these days we're going to see him. Amen? May God help us to be alive. Amen? To be alive. To be ready to serve our Lord, however that we get the opportunity. To decide today, I'm going to continue with those spiritual disciplines it does matter if you live a holy life. It does matter if you talk to the Lord in prayer. It does really matter if you learn and live in this book and stay in it and never get out of it. One little story before I finish up. How do you get to know this book? How do you get to know it? Well, I liken it to the time when I grew up on a farm in Webster County. We bought a, my dad bought a farm in it when I was about 12, 13 years old. 420 acres that, that had 100 acres of bottom land, and we farmed that land. And uh, we put fences all the way around it. 
uh, I got to farm and plow and disc and rake hay and, and work those fields in that hundred acres. I knew where every ditch was. I knew where every big rock was that we couldn't dig up. I knew where all those things were that were a hazard to avoid because I'd been in it a long time. I'd been every, on every inch of it. I knew what to dodge and how to get around on some of the fields and how to, how to bring in the, the crops and how, to, how the harvest had to happen. And you know, the more you spend time in this, it's going to be just like the back of your hand. You're going to know it. You're going to live in it. It's going to be alive to you. And when you go through a hard time, those verses are going to pop out in your heart and mind. And it's going to help you to, to navigate those challenges of life and help you to reach the other side and be clothed in white and hear him say, well done. Amen and amen.